During the early 1950s, the riddle of the Dead Sea Scrolls takes a new turn. Father Roland Devaux, under the supervision of the Jordanian government, organizes a major excavation of the slumbering ruins at the site of Kirbet Qumran, which lay in close proximity to the caves themselves. Devaux is a meticulous scholar, as well as a Roman Catholic priest. He's a veteran in the region, part of the Catholic Church's permanent presence in the land of the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. It takes him six grueling years to excavate the ruins, and what he finds is nothing less than astounding. As the diggers meticulously remove the rubble from the site, the entire ancient settlement begins to appear. Unfortunately, when it comes to the science of archaeology, most of his finds would never be published. In any case, here in a nutshell is the picture that began to emerge regarding the history of the site. It appears that the earliest settlement at what came to be called Qumran was founded in the 8th to 7th centuries BCE, toward the end of the first temple period, thanks to traces of a modest fort or fortified farmhouse found in the ruins. It's been identified possibly as Schacha, or the City of Salt, referenced in the book of Joshua. Bamidbar bet ha'arava, midin u'schacha, v'hanivshan v'ir ha'melach, v'ein gedi arim shesh v'chatsrehen. That early structure was restored and enlarged in the late second century BCE, most likely during the rule of Hasmonean King John Hyrcanus. Later, under King Alexander Yanai in the early first century BCE, the plan of the site evolved during additional settlement and construction. That included an aqueduct leading from a cliff above Wadi Qumran, a few hundred meters to the east. Floodwaters during the winter rains fill the reservoir behind a dam at the foot of the cliff and fed the many cisterns, including what were identified as ritual immersion baths, or mikvaot. The layout of the site is uniquely dissimilar to other settlements that, of that period, featuring multiple large halls, likely designed for public functions, and a limited number of living quarters. The settlement's main entrance was at the foot of a watchtower to the north. The building's walls consisted of stones gathered at the foot of the cliff and were covered with thick white-gray plaster. The doorposts and windows were made of well-trimmed stones, the roofs being composed of wooden beams, straw, and plaster, as was common at that time. It was the rooms themselves that most captivated Devaux. The central structure at this site was composed of several rooms. Some included a second floor with a courtyard in the middle. There was a thick-walled square watchtower on the northwest corner, rising above the other structures. It likely functioned as a lookout tower for 
warning and protecting the community in the event of raids by desert tribes. In one room, there were benches along the walls, perhaps for Torah study or as a meeting place for the sectarians. To the south and east of the main structure were additional buildings containing various rooms, immersion baths, and long halls. One of these must have been used for meetings and as a dining hall. Adjacent to it was a storage room and kitchen where hundreds of pottery vessels and a great number of small food bowls were discovered, piled neatly in stacks. On the southeastern edge of the site, there was also a workshop for the production of pottery vessels. Here, our excavators uncovered a basin used for preparing clay, a potter's wheel, and two kilns for firing. And there were multiple cisterns and ritual baths, mikvaot, found in various locations, covered with gray hydraulic plaster for waterproofing. And they were supplied by water from the aqueduct. We even found a wide descending staircase with a plaster-covered ridge in the middle, separating those going down for immersion from those coming up purified. In the year 31 BCE, an earthquake seriously damaged the buildings, including the cisterns and mikvaot. Cracks in the walls and a thick layer of ash from a fire were revealed in DeVoe's excavations. The ancient Jewish historian Josephus Flavius recorded it. Afterwards, the site lay abandoned until the early first century CE, at which time members of the community returned and resettled it. The earlier structures, with various additions and modifications, were re-inhabited. We must, of course, mention DeVoe's smoking gun. In the main building was a long room with a number of plaster tables and benches, which give every indication, detective that DeVoe was, that these are the very furnishings used by what he conceived as an ancient Jewish monastic order, known as the Essenes, who carefully inscribed the scrolls. DeVoe came upon the tables in a long room he called the scriptorium. In his mind, it was here that monk-like scribes labored day and night, while others constantly read aloud the sacred text in shifts. DeVoe was sure he had come upon the headquarters of the very sect that composed this ancient library, the Essenes. But in all of this, there's one thing we need to bear in mind. DeVoe himself a Dominican monk, was drawn to possible parallels between these mysterious texts and Christianity. When he conceived of this site as an ancient monastery, was he perhaps stamping his own preconceptions on it? What we do know is that the settlement's buildings were blocked on the east side by a substantial stone wall. Beyond the wall, marl terraces extended several hundred meters, finally ending in a cliff. A, a large cemetery of over a thousand graves arranged in north-south rows extended across this marl surface. Several were excavated, revealing simple graves dug one by one into the marl, each covered with a pile of stones. Most of the skeletons were male, though toward the edge of the cemetery, graves of females and children were also uncovered. In the year 68 CE, during the Jewish revolt against Rome, the settlement was destroyed, never again to be occupied. After all the years that passed since DeVoe's great dig of the 1950s, the jury is still out on the ruins of Qumran, and every conclusion has been up for grabs. 
in 1988, two Belgian archaeologists returned to Qumran to re-examine, that is to find fault with, the findings of DeVoe. Even before publishing their findings, they gave an interview on public television, the program called Nova, devoted to the scrolls, charging that the entire site isn't an ancient monastery at all, but a wealthy Roman villa. What about the plaster writing tables DeVoe had found? They identified them as dining room tables. And they said that several elegant ceramic urns found by DeVoe actually belonged to a perfume and cosmetic industry located in the region during Roman times. They claimed that the Jewish immersion baths were only cisterns. And as for the communal dining room, it was actually just an assembly hall common to villas of the period. So they claimed. Then there's the theory put forth by Professor Norman Golb of the University of Chicago. His conclusion, Qumran was neither a monastery nor a villa. It was, in fact, a military fortress, ultimately put to use by the Zealot Party, anti-Roman freedom fighters of the first century. Yet another theory is that the settlement was, in actuality, an ancient pottery factory. That, according to two Israeli archaeologists, Yitzhak Magen and Yuval Pelig, Qumran, they insist, had nothing to do with the Dead Sea Scrolls found in the nearby caves. Says Magen, Your vision of a couple hundred celibate Essenes padding around praying whenever they were not copying scrolls in a special room designated the scrollery, only to end up buried in a silent cemetery of more than a thousand single graves is a work of the imagination, not history or archaeology. What was Qumran? In its first phase, it was a Hasmonean fortress built to protect the eastern frontier of the kingdom. Later, it was just a pottery factory manned by a few dozen workers at most. This conclusion is inescapable. Magen doesn't dispute the contention that at least two of the cisterns excavated by DeVoe fit the description of mikvaot, but he notes that the largest of these cisterns holds in excess of 300 cubic meters of water. That's enormous compared with other mikvaot found in other parts of ancient Israel. He also points out that just before the points where the water would enter a number of cisterns, we find hollows where sediments would likely have collected. That would have made the cisterns unkosher for use as mikvaot. These cisterns were used for something else entirely. What about the hundreds of clay dishes found in the room identified by DeVoe as the pantry? Magen argues that they haven't been completely accounted for. We have to ask why so many were found intact and why there were so many to begin with when far fewer would have sufficed to feed everybody at the settlement. Magen and Peleg contend that these dishes were in fact the chief product of the site. And in the process of digging out the debris that filled the large cistern, they discovered a fine layer of clay amounting to roughly three tons. This clay is what was fashioned into dishes and fired into two large ovens found in the excavations. That would explain the substantial number of dishes uncovered in a room that was not a pantry, but a storage room for finished merchandise. It would also rule out Qumran as a place of learning and contemplation, since it would have been impossible to study in the midst of a loud, dirty factory. This, they contend, was the site's raison d'etre, a fortress which, after the Roman conquest in 63 BCE and the dissolution of the Hasmonean army, became, at the hands of the out-of-work soldiers, a pottery factory. What about such theories? Was Qumran a Roman villa? 
a fort guarding the trade routes in the area, or a center for fashioning pots. Arguments like these are, of course, hotly contested among leading scholars. It's pointed out that elegant artifacts, such as fluted urns or perfumes, are no more out of place in an ancient religious monastery, as Devoe liked to envision it, than the many examples of gold and silver artwork found in monasteries today. And the pottery found at Qumran is in fact of a poor and common grade, which we wouldn't expect to find in a villa, much less in a pottery production center. As American archeologist Jody Magnus observes, while there's no doubt that pottery was produced at Qumran, there's also no evidence that it was anywhere marketed for that matter. As for the contention that Qumran was a fort, take note, the settlement has no fortress-like wall, and the outer walls are no thicker than the inner walls. And finally, there are the scrolls themselves. We really can't dismiss the sheer proximity of the caves to the ruins at this site. Curator Emeritus of the Shrine of the Book Museum, Magen Broshi, argued that the fact that Cave 4, with its vast hoard of parchments, is situated just across the ravine from the settlement simply can't be coincidental. There must be a connection. The scrolls must have been composed there, or at least gathered there. Broshi took the additional step of excavating the ancient trails leading back and forth from the caves to the settlement, uncovering abundant remains, such as fragments from ancient sandals, and even teeth from 2,000-year-old combs. Clearly, there was a good deal of human traffic linking the site of Qumran with the caves. And that's a big problem for those who claim that whoever lived at the settlement had nothing to do with the scrolls. Not surprisingly, many others have joined the debate. Professor Yitzhak Hirschfeld of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem agrees that the earliest Second Temple phase of Qumran, around 100 BCE, amounted to a large fortified Hasmonean tower. But Hirschfeld argued that the cisterns were drinking water pools and that the inhabitants who used them were farm workers, possibly producing highly valued balsam essence or cultivating date palms between the settlement and the spring of Ein Feshka to the south. But Dr. Magen points out that these cisterns were dug inside the building complex after the initial phase of the compound had already been constructed. Why would cisterns be placed inside the complex when the inhabitants could just as easily have dug them outside? The only reason would be if the settlement had been industrial and the cisterns part of the production process. In any case, there is no question as to the Jewishness of the inhabitants of Qumran. Pottery shards have been discovered at the site inscribed with Jewish names, as well as stone vessels used by Jews of the period in order to abide by the Jewish purity laws. But were these people Essenes? We also have to cope with the question of how many people lived at Qumran from the first century BCE through the first century CE. Supporters of the ancient Jewish monastery theory assume there were over 100, as many as 250. Curator Emeritus of the Jerusalem Shrine of the Book Museum, Magen Broshi, pointed out that the dining room could accommodate 120 people. A longtime supporter of the Essene theory, Broshi also notes that many of the inhabitants most likely lived in the very caves in which the scrolls were discovered much as monks of the Byzantine period lived in similar caves in other parts of the desert of Judea. It was Broshi who referred to Qumran as the first monastery in the Western world. But Magen counters that Qumran's inhabitants would never have lived in caves such as these. 
where wild beasts, including leopards and hyenas, were frequent guests. When it comes to the population size of the enigmatic settlement, complications arise due to one of the most bizarre discoveries. Animal bones deposited in jars. Might these represent the remains of the community's meals packed away rather than being discarded as refuse so that wild animals would not be lured to the site? That said, Magen and Peleg suggest that the bones comprise the remains of not more than one or two hundred sheep. Hardly enough substance for a community numbering 120 or so members during a time frame of some 150 years. They therefore conclude that a much smaller number of people lived at the settlement at any one time. Perhaps only about 25, though Professor Hirschfeld thinks there may have been a few dozen. This, as I have said regarding other cases in my illustrious career, is a two-pipe problem. For many years after the excavation of the site, Qumran was interpreted in light of the scrolls. But thanks to the many challenges raised regarding the archaeology itself, the scrolls are being evaluated in a new light. According to Hirschfeld's argument, Qumran was an estate belonging to Judea's elite class, most likely members of the priesthood. And the scrolls were the remains of a large Jerusalem library, possibly the temple library. They were smuggled from Jerusalem to Qumran, whose inhabitants were sympathizers or even family. They were then deposited in caves from which they could be retrieved at the end of the Great Revolt. But as Magen Broshi observes, the great majority of the fragments, hundreds upon hundreds, were discovered in cave number four, which he believes was the library of the Essene sectarians. When the Roman army arrived in the year 68 CE, they vandalized everything, leaving behind only fragments. But the scrolls hidden in the caves were not found by the Romans and survived uncannily intact. As for the books discovered among the scrolls, Broshi believes that they tell us a lot about what was favored among the Essenes, who he believes were the forerunners of Christianity. They include Deuteronomy, Psalms, and Isaiah. Says Broshi, it is hardly surprising that these are also the books most frequently quoted in the New Testament. For his part, Yitzhak Magen details how he thinks the scrolls got there. They were brought here by everybody, including fugitives running away from the Romans. Some of them would have taken a scroll with them, but when they ran away from the Judean hills eastward, they had to cross the water, which is something they didn't want to do with the scroll. Magen suggests that it was these fugitives who sequestered the scrolls among the caves in the vicinity of the now deserted settlement of Qumran. That would mean that they're not priestly or sectarian compositions at all. This is the literature of Second Temple era Judaism. This belonged to everybody. The amazing thing is that even after two long millennia, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the legacy they convey still belong to everybody. And with the tools of archaeology at our disposal, everybody may one day know a great deal more about who lived in this barren wilderness known today as Kirbet Qumran.